So uh, hope you all having a good morning. Um, so let me give you a little bit of background on the topic today. I think we, uh, uh, we're all sort of managing the deployment of applications on a regular basis and the, um, uh, <laughs> the constraints and the pressures that are being put on it uh, are immense, right? The complexities are getting more and more on a regular basis, right, uh, in the SDLC process. And if we think about it, you know, things like cycle times are changing on a regular basis. We're being pushed to put out more of the application, um, you know, pushing it into uh, <clears throat> a Git repo, getting it out uh, in the deployment perspective. And in doing so, we've got to balance out a lot of things, right? Got to balance out the deployment times. So think about cost, um, security. And we have to constantly make sure that uh, the deployment of that application is, is efficient. And you know, th that pressure is immense. And in a lot of cases, um, you know, we think about doing some of the checks that we need to do on a regular basis, sometimes pre and post. And, uh, and, and I'll be honest, I think a lot of people will, will take some uh, cut some corners if we have to, right? Um, and that's just part of the process. It's, uh, it, it, there's a lot of pressure these days. Um, but that leads to us spending more time remediating issues, right? Um, and they will occur, potentially post-deployment. And that really kind of takes a little bit of fun out, right? I like to call it the, uh, the reduction of my mean time to happy hour, right? not going to have a lot of time to, uh, and then have to spend it on actually fixing problems. So the concept of shift left is to help you kind of alleviate some of that. And so start thinking about how to make um, the process a lot more efficient. And specifically in any of those checks, right, <clears throat> there's lots of things we can do around cost, security, performance, et cetera. And today we'll talk specifically about security and the aspects of shifting left with security into the SDLC process. Uh, and we'll talk in, 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 in general really about what that process is like in getting that started, what collaboration means, um, and how to kind of implement that at a, at, at a business level, right? And today we have a, a great panel with us. And uh, I'd love for you guys to just kind of intro yourself and um, give a little about uh, how you interact with SDLC. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll start with, with you, Jeremy, at the end. Thank you. So uh, my name is Jeremy. Uh, I'm a solution arch architect at uh, My Data Model. It's a company that uh, uses small data to generate some uh, predictive model. And this model are, are used for um, business experts uh, to, to help them to uh, uh, know and understand their, their data. Uh, what, uh, how I interact with uh, SDLC, uh, it's uh, at the specification and the uh, implementation. Uh, the whole stack expect the, the, the first one, the, the input of the, the SDLC. So, uh, I have a lot of um, uh, 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 sorry. We, with the shifting left uh, duty, uh, we prevent flows into the production uh, mm -hmm. at the early stage. So it's a big, uh, it's a big step for us. Sure. Thank you. Sorry. Hi everyone. <laughs> sorry for that. <laughs> We're all awake now. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let's adjust the levels. Perfect. Um, hello, everyone. Philippe Lafoucrier. I'm a distinguished engineer at uh, GitLab for uh, Secure and Defend. Um, I joined GitLab with an, an acquisition. I was the CEO and founder of Gymnasium. So this is how I got started with, uh, with security a few years ago. Uh, we were acquired by uh, GitLab last year. And this is actually how GitLab started uh, their security features. Um, uh, as for the SDLC, we are uh, dog fooding our features at GitLab. We are drinking our own champagne, as I like to say. So we are living by the SDLC uh, pretty much every day. Um, we are transforming that to include security as much as we can, uh, especially since some part of secure and defense. So I'm pushing that as, as hard as I can. Um, and yeah, that's, that's it for me. 
Sorry? Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sodirak Sima. I work for Goldman Sachs. My job is to run application security activities, but since the organization is going to more fast delivery of asset in production, we found ourselves to be interacting constantly with the engineers which they have the DevOps or the DevOps engineer of the organization to introduce this uh, tool. So day to day, my job is to push the security part of uh, DevOps, so we call that <laughs> DevSecOps. Uh, my primary responsibility is to engineer the solution to make this solution available to the whole organization, given the size of Goldman Sachs itself. Thanks, Sodi. Um, let me give a little bit of background on, on also myself and, and my interaction with SDLC. Um, I, I lead a developer advocacy team at, at VMware, and we talk to a significant amount of enterprises. Um, and, you know, I think we, we all think about what shift left means, and there's always this concept, and we'll talk about it today, of adding the security bits. One of the things that we constantly see um, is that there's a lot of day two based operations that are occurring that just now we're starting to think about getting added in uh, on the security side. Um, and it's not as obvious. Um, it's also a little bit of a surprise when we talk to them about it. Um, so we're seeing that also in enterprises now as, as cloud operations and secure and, and DevOps with security is sort of getting combined, right? Um, and I think we have this general no notion of, of shift left um, as being dev-centric, right? <clears throat> but I think it's more than that. It's also a little bit of cloud ops. But uh, it now starts specifically with, I think, the developers and getting the teams, whether it's security or development uh, or the operations people, um, uh, to buy in on that, right? And so, you know, being a, a small company, right, Jeremy, I think it's interesting to understand, you know, how you thought of that and how did you actually get your development teams to start buying in on that because they have to add uh, more bits now, right, and more components into the process. Um, so we'd love to hear a couple of examples of what you've sort of been through in convincing the developers to kind of go down this path. Um, at the high level of uh, the security, uh, it's quite simple to, uh, to convince the, the, the dev team uh, because if there is some uh, seniority in, a, in the team, they use some best practice at the early stage of the of the designing of uh, at the, the early stage of uh, implementation, so it's quite simple to uh, to uh, to get buy-ins from this. Uh, when you go deeper, it's more complex because if you don't have some skills into the team, no one will uh, will uh, have the uh, will shift naturally with, uh, through the, the security uh, into the, the the design stage. So it's quite quite complex. Uh, during a design meeting or a refinement meeting, we have to, to decide which one will be the, the paranoid man and uh, raise some question about security. Mm -hmm. So it's an uh, everyday exercise for, uh, for all of us. So it's a, it's, it's a process of getting them in, in yes, yes. Uh, to buy in, and, and, yes. and that process takes some time, right? Yes. Um, so speaking of process, I mean, I guess initiating that process is interesting, right? Once you convince them, you talk about some of the benefits and, 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 and kind of work through that. Um, you know, in, in the business, I guess, and in, in, in at Goldman, I think so to you that, that you've kind of been through this, right? I'd be love to hear a little bit about how you have actually initiated that process what it's been like uh, setting up that kind of that structure and you know post it convincing and, and actually getting um, uh, that moving and what are the hurdles that you've sort of seen right sure yeah so that is really tough problem to solve you cannot take an organization of the size of Goldman and deploy a static analyzer tools across everyone overnight and you expect next day the process to work so what we did inside Goldman is to provide uh, an adoption plan. The adoption plan was generated by a core engineering team and by tech technology risk team, which is my team. And we try to inject these small scanners, allow me to call that in purely way, small scanners, SAST, DUST, dependency checking, 
in family. We call that in family meaning we deploy inside techries or a small um, group of engineers and we see there the problem. We see by deploying a static code analyzer, we'll see that the developers will have the problems of that, we'll have false positive, we'll have people complaining or we break the, the DevOps pipeline. As, as soon as we see this problem, we start to figure out how to resolve each of them before we go into higher scale. So from 10 people, we go to 100 people, then to 1,000 people, and then uh, firm-wide. That is the only way that we can see the adoption and the process to, to work in. And we do that for each tool. As you can understand, each tool has different characteristics, different uh, output. Uh, people receive that differently. And so now you're, you're uh, how long is that, just curious, how long is that taken and where are you on that process now? You're still moving through it or? Um, I cannot disclose very okay. much information on how we're doing Goldman Sachs, but um, I, I, I allow me to say in a different way that even if we have a product for static analyzer today, after two years we need to engineer again with a new okay. product that is coming to market for new technologies, new tools, etc. So I think that is constantly a way of adopting the new processes and the new tools that mm -hmm. we do, regardless if we have something that we call today mature. Sure, yeah, so you're constantly uh, visiting that and, and then revisiting it, right? Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. Um, so as that process gets started, I think one of, the, one of the main questions around this is now, how do we go through and actually pick what some of the security components are that we're going to add into um, that process? Um, so Philippe, I think it'd be interesting to get your perspective on this and, uh, uh, you know, what do you pick? Uh, what are some of the baseline components that actually, you know, should be there uh, initially? And then what are some uh, options on top of that? Now, every business is different, right? And everybody's going to pick what they need, but we great to get some examples from you. Yeah, sure. So first of all, I think that security should be a shared goal between uh, not only the DevOps team, but the, the DevOps and the, the security team. Um, and I think that we are still doing security today as we were doing QA 15 years ago. We are doing security on very specific platforms like a staging or a, uh, QA environments. And if you think about that, we were doing exactly the same 15 years ago. We didn't have any CI CD by the time and we created that maybe, I don't know, 12 to, to, to 15 years ago. And we started there to automate the process we started to stop relying on the quality team at that point. And we are doing exactly the same mistake today. We are relying on a security team on a different timeline, on a different uh, SDLC loop, the, the security team has their own loop, actually. They are acting on a different timeline. When they have some results, they have to uh, disrupt and to uh, disturb the, the DevOps teams. Um, so when it comes to components, um, I would say that automation is the key there. So as Sodi said, uh, starting with, uh, with very simple things like SAS, DAS, dependency scanning, everything that would cover the security checks of the code itself and the code that is shipping to production that your team is not especially writing, like all the dependencies, that's something that you definitely need to take care of uh, because most of the, the, the security issues that we're seeing are not only coming from the code that we are writing, but also from the configuration and everything. And uh, I can also mention someone else from uh, Goldman Sachs who told me yesterday, and I, I really love that quote, uh, we are one policy away from being public on the S3 bucket. And that's true. If you automate and if you have a security team that, that is able to uh, really have a deep understanding what, of what you are doing, you are able to scale that security team. And uh, again, automation is, is the key there. It's the only way to scale uh, the, the security team so that they can have more time to deal with that kind of issues. No, that, that's right. I think uh, I mean, adding that automation is important, right? And um, I think you said something interesting there, which is I think if we think about adding security components uh, as they've kind of evolved SAST and DAST and doing image verification, it sort of comes to top of the mind a lot of times in the CI perspective. But as you indicated, we're, we're sort of going into um, public cloud on Amazon, Azure, Google, and the ability to also double check and I think, you know, uh, things like, hey, do I have my policy set up, right, in S3, or do I have my policy set up correctly for this user? Are there any issues? We gotta start thinking about, and I think it's not natural right now, but it needs to be, which is to start checking 
um, for those types of issues in your environments that are going to public cloud because they're constantly changing. And that's kind of in the CD portion of it, right? So it's a, you know, doing the shift left is, is actually fairly comprehensive on both, I think, the CI and the CD piece, right? Um, and so as we add these, um, and you know, we talked about some of the pressures that are coming in um, in ensuring that <clears throat> uh, we have an ability to kind of uh, deliver rapidly, right? Those pressures, you know, uh, change the metrics. And one of the issues is how do we now, with all of these additions, ensure that the metrics around actually delivering the applications is consistent, right? And how do we keep that? Um, and, and being at Goldman, I think so, do you, and it'd be interesting to hear some of your take on this and, you know, as you've kind of gone through that process, how have you ensured that, that those metrics um, are a little more consistent and how do you get to um, uh, ensuring that you're still meeting them, right, with all these new additions? Sure. So, metrics. We definitely take the advantage of having centralized systems and DevOps via GitLab, for example, is a centralized tool for us to look in a single place. Uh, within Goldman, we have, or at least I have, two specific metrics. One is the effectiveness of security controls, seeing every pipeline has or not have a, a scanners from uh, my team, and therefore to see the output of the scanners. But there is another metric that the leadership of organization wants to see from my side. Uh, we transit from uh, traditional application security, manual activities, manual penetration tests, code review, which meaning people doing the, the work, delivering the outputs, to more automated things. So how we can take the output of these metrics, the effectiveness of these security controls, and to prove to the business how we save money, how we, now that we have DevOps, or better saying DevSecOps in this case, how we can do less code review. And specifically, when you go to an organization which you have thousands and thousands of developers shipping code every day. And uh, to Goldman Sachs, this is the two key things that I'm looking after, like the effectiveness of security controls, thanks to the centralized DevOps solution that we have, and small uh, engine or scanners outside GitLab that are integrated with GitLab, and then how all of these activities that I'm doing actually can be scalable and can save some money from uh, money or time, however someone want to quantify this, from manual activities that previous was doing. We're still doing, but how we transit to that more continuous DevSecOps. That's great. Um, I think we've got a few minutes left. Thank you for that. I th um, I'm going to ask one last question. I think we'll open up uh, for questions uh, with the audience. But uh, Jeremy, uh, it would be interesting to understand, you know, now that you guys have implemented and you're going through this, um, what are some of the benefits that you're seeing now uh, with the addition of this? Um, yeah, the, the, the big one is uh, less frustration uh, for the, the dev teams or for the security teams. Uh, more synchronized uh, timeline. So, the, the, but the really big one is less frustration. Uh, sorry, uh, Philip, you add to that on the benefit side? Um, yes, actually, uh, the less frustration that Jeremy say that is really key to us. Like we deal, like we went from manual activities into automated activities. So if you had one problem before, now we have 10 problems. And this is, this, this is really uh, difficult for us to manage. So when we deploy a new tool or a new process, we look very carefully what the engineer across the organization will tell us to take that feedback as the first citizen feedback rather than what we think in isolation as a security team. Thanks. Uh, Philippe, yeah? Um, yeah, I think that the, I will agree with uh, with Sodi and, uh, and Jeremy. The main benefit that we are seeing is uh, less frustration from the, the development team, but also um, we are seeing the team, the, the security team, scaling really with that. Uh, with automation, uh, we are catching the longing fruits, and that leaves more space in the end for the security team to deal with the very tricky cases like authentication uh, problems or that kind of things. So it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely beneficial for us as well. That's great. Well, I, I want to thank you guys for some of the questions, but um, I think we've got a, probably a minute left or two, so we'd love to hear any questions from the audience. So. Any
Anybody? We have one there. I'm interested in the topic of um, in, uh, security vulnerabilities in open source libraries, which can be quite buried deep within projects. and wondered if this has been an issue for any of you and how you've addressed it. Uh, yes. So sometimes we call that dependency checking or software composition analysis. I think every organization should have that capability, specifically if it's using open source. I think everyone currently is using open source if we don't call that. but facing down a, uh, a library from outside, whatever language is that, you have to check what the world is saying about vulnerabilities within that. So we have tools to do that. We have automated tools to do that. Uh, you can, you know more or less the name. I'm not going to name the, the big uh, players on that. Also GitLab has the security capabilities to do the dependency scanning, uh, and Philip can speak more about that. We take that tools and we try to integrate to the DevOps. So there, then, we expose these findings back to the developers and or the engineers, however you want to call them, to fix that directly or to speak then with my team to uh, find a middle ground if something cannot be fixed. Let's say that we have a latest uh, version of that library and has a vulnerability or zero day, which was we don't, no one have a patch, which is the open source path. So then we find a mitigation solution until a new version uh, with a patch is presented. Do you want to add something on that? No, I think you, you covered it well. Um, de dependencies are really a big deal today. Uh, we are seeing that, for example, at GitLab directly in, uh, in the source code. We have uh, 100 first level dependencies in GitLab. And when we install GitLab, actually, we install more than 1,000 dependencies. So that means the portion of the code that we are shipping from GitLab is really tiny compared to the portion of code that we are shipping from the third parties that we don't know. We do nothing about them. So uh, we, we track down with dependency scanning. Uh, this is one of the, the automated tools that we have at GitLab. But we also have the security team being very vigilant to any new dependency that we would introduce. So that's why we have uh, something in our process in the merge request directly. We are showing the new dependencies that would be introduced by a change. So that very early in the process, we can take the decision if we change something in our uh, dependencies ex exposure. Anybody else? Uh, do you have manual eyes on every new dependency? So you actually look into the source code, or do you rely on um, third party checkers to, to check that for you? I, can you repeat that? I think we had a hard yeah, time you, hearing Could it. you repeat that? Sorry, I didn't answer your question. So do you actually manually review the code that you're creating a dependency to, or do you rely on third party dependency checkers to check it for you? That's a great question. Uh, I would chime in if you don't mind. Um, two different things. Uh, if it's a very regular dependencies, I would say, uh, we rely on the tools that we have. So it's basically matching the version of the dependency that we're using with our databases. Uh, we have a, a public database of advisories for all the dependencies in many various languages. Uh, but when it comes to something very sensible like uh, authentication or that kind of things, then we, uh, we like to have the security team being involved to review the code, review the, the dependency, review if the dependency is still maintained, uh, the algorithms, uh, everything related to cryptography. And it's, we, we can't just rely on advisories for that. We need to have a deep understanding of what's going on there because that code, again, is going to ship to production with, with our code and running there. You <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, we're out of time, but um, I want to thank the panel here for, uh, <clears throat> for sort of the answers. Thank and uh, we'll be around for some questions uh, after this. So thank you.